Chapter 1 The Otis elevator climbing the south pillar of the Eiffel Tower was overflowing with tourists. Inside the cramped lift, an aust austere businessman in a pressed suit gazed down at the boy beside him. You look pale, son. You should have stayed on the ground. I'm okay, the boy answered, struggling to control his anxiety. I'll get out as... I'll get out on the next level. I can't breathe. The old man... Oh, the man leaned closer. I thought by now you would have gotten over this. He brushed the... the he brushed the child's cheek affectionately. The boy felt ashamed to disappoint his father, but he could barely hear through the ringing in his ear. In his ears. I can't breathe. I've got to get out of this box. The elevator operator was saying something reassuring about the lift's articulated pistons and puddled iron construction. Far beneath them, the streets of Paris stretch, stretched out in all directions. Almost there, the boy told himself, craning his neck and looking up at the unloading platform. Just hang on. As the lift angled steadily towards the upper viewing deck, the shaft began to narrow, its massive struts, struts contracting into a tight vertical tunnel. Dad, I don't think... Suddenly, a staccato, a staccato crack echoed overhead. The carriage jerked, swaying awkwardly to one side. Frayed cables, <coughs> frayed cables began whisp, uh, whipping around the carriage, thrashing like snakes. The boy reached out for his father. Dad! Their eyes locked for one terrible second. Then the bottom dropped out. Robert Langdon jolted upright in his soft leather seat, startled out of the semi-conscious daydream. He, had, or he was sitting all alone in the enormous cabin of a Falcon 2000 EX corporate jet as it bounced as it bounced its way through turbulence. In the background, the dual Pratt and Whitney engines hummed evenly. Mr. Langdon, the intercom cracked or crackled overhead. We're on final approach. Langdon sat up straight and slid his lecture notes back into his leather day bag. He'd been halfway through reviewing most a Masonic symbology when his mind had drifted. The daydream about his late father, Langdon suspected, had been stirred by the morning's unexpected invitation from Langdon's longtime mentor, Peter Solomon. The other man I never want to disappear, or the other man I never want to disappoint. The 58-year-old philanthropist, historian, and scientist had taken Langdon under his wing nearly 30 years ago, in many ways filling the void left by, by Langdon's father's death. Despite the man's influential family dynasty and massive wealth, Langdon had found human or humility and warmth in Solomon's, in Solomon's soft grey eyes. Grey eyes, ooh. Outside the window, the sun had set, but Langdon could still make out the slender silhouette of the world's largest obelisk rising on the horizon like the spire of an ancient knob. Gnomon, 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 what the? Gnomon. The 555 foot marble faced obelisk masked this nation's heart. All around the sphere, the sphere, the meticulous geometry of streets and monuments radiated outwards. Even from the air, Washington, D.C. exuded an almost mythical power. Langdon loved the city, as or, and as the jet touched down, he felt a rising excitement about what laid ahead. The jet taxied to a private terminal somewhere in the vast expanse of Dulles, or Dooley's International Airport and came to a stop. Langdon gathered his, uh, uh, Langdon gathered his things, thanked the pilots and stepped out of the jet's luxurious interior. 
onto the fold-out staircase. The cold January air felt liberated, liberating. Breathe, Robert, he thought, appreciating the wild open spaces. A blanket of white fog crept across the runway, and Langdon had, had the sensation he was stepping into a marsh as he descended onto the mystic the misty tarmac hello hello a sing-song british a sing-song british voice sounded from shouted from across the way professor langdon langdon looked up to see a middle-aged woman with a badge and cupboard hurrying towards him waving happily as he approached curly blonde hair protruded under or from under her stylish knit wool hat Welcome to Washington, sir. Langdon smiled. Thank you. My name's Pam from Passenger Services. The woman spoke with an exuberance that was almost unsettling. If you'll come with me, sir, your car is waiting. Langdon followed her across the tarmac towards the signature terminal, which was surrounded by glistening private jets, a taxi stand for the rich and famous. I hate to embarrass you, Professor, the woman said, sounding sheep, sheepish, but you are the Robert Langdon who writes books about symbols and religion, aren't you? Langdon hesitated and then nodded. I thought so, she said, beaming. My book group read your book about the sacred feminine and the church. What a delicious scandal that one caused. You do enjoy putting the fox in the hen house. Langdon smiled. Scandal wasn't really my intention. The woman seemed to sense Langdon was not in the mood to discuss his work. I'm sorry. Listen to me rant, rattling on. I know you probably get tired of being recognized, but it's your own fault, she, she playfully mentioned to his clothing. Your uniform gave you away. My uniform? Lan Langdon glanced down at his attire. He was wearing his usual charcoal turtleneck, Harris tweed jacket, khakis, and collegiate Cordovan loafers. His standard attire for the classroom, lecture circuit, author photos, and social events. The woman laughed. Those turtlenecks you wear are so dated, you'd look so much sharper in a tie. Or you'd look so much sharper in a tie. No chance, Langdon thought. Little nooses. Neckties had been required six days a week when Langdon attended Philip Exeter Academy. And despite the headmaster's romantic claims that the origin of the cravat went back to the silk facet, Oh man, Fascalia worn by Roman orators to warm their vocal cords, to warm their vocal cords. Langan knew that etymologically, cravat actually derived from a ruthless band of Croat mercenaries who donned knotted neckerchiefs before they stormed into battle. To this day, ancient uh, to this day, the ancient battle garb was donned by modern office warriors hoping to, intim hoping to intimidate their enemies in daily boardroom battles. Thanks for the advice, Langdon said with a chuckle. I'll consider the tie in the future. Mercifully, a professional-looking man in a dark suit got out of a sleek Lincoln Town car parked near the terminal and held up his finger. Mr. Langdon... I'm Charles with Beltway Limousine. He opened the passenger door. Good evening, sir. Welcome to Washington. Langdon tipped Pam for her hospitality and then climbed into the plush interior of the town car. The driver showed him the temperature controls, the bottled water and the basket of hot muffins. Seconds later, Langdon was speeding away on a private access road. So this is how... The other half lives. I wouldn't say half, but okay. As the driver gunned up the car, or as the driver gunned the car up Windsock Drive, he consulted his passenger manifest and placed a quick call. This is Beltway Limousine, the driver said with a professional 
efficacy, uh, efficiency, I was asked to confirm. Once my passenger had landed, he paused. Yes, sir, your guest, Mr. Langdon, has arrived, and I will deliver him to the Capitol building by 7 p.m. You're welcome, sir. He hung up. Langdon had to smile. No stone left unturned. Peter Solomon's attention to detail was one of his most potent assets, allowing him to manage his substantial power, power with apparent ease. A few billion dollars in the bank doesn't hurt either. Langdon settled into the plush leather seat and closed his eyes as the noise of the airfield faded beneath him. The, U the US capital was half hour away and he appreciated the time alone to gather his thoughts. Everything had happened so quickly today that Langdon only knew or that, at, that Langdon only now had begun to think in earnest about the incredible evening that lay ahead. Arriving under a veil of secrecy, Langdon thought, amused by the prospect. Prospect. Ten miles from Capitol Building, a lone figure was eagerly preparing for Robert Langdon's arrival.